Hi everybody, good evening. My name is Sally Clark. I work for the University of Washington and welcome to Louder Than Words. This is our uh, April 13th edition. Our guest tonight for our coach lead play, The Future of the Student Athlete, is Will Conroy. Will Conroy is the associate head coach for men's basketball at the University of Washington. Former men's basketball standout. That makes you sound old, but you're not. Um, <laughs> Conroy helped the Huskies reach the NCAA tournament in back-to-back -back years and earn the program's first number one seed, while also making their first Sweet 16 appearance since 1998. Conroy led the Dogs to consecutive Pac-12 tournament championship games in 2004 and 2005. Washington's 29 wins that season tied a 67-year-old school record. Following his collegiate career, Conroy spent seven years playing in the NBA and overseas. During his pro career, Conroy was given the 2009 NBA D-League Sportsmanship Award and saw action for the Grizzlies, the Clippers, the Rockets, and the Timberwolves. Conroy is no stranger to the Seattle basketball scene as he attended Garfield High School. Usually somebody says something when I said that, and led the program to four straight league championships. In 2015, <laughs> Conroy earned his bachelor's degree from the University of Washington in drama. Our uh, facilitator tonight is the co-conspirator who I value the most. Dean Ed Taylor is vice provost and dean of the undergraduate academic affairs world at the University of Washington, where he oversees educational opportunities that advance and deepen the undergraduate academic experience. A professor in the College of Education, his research interests include the moral dimensions of education, leadership in education, and social justice. His PhD is from the University of Washington. And with that, I will hand it over to you, gentlemen, for the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited that you're here. Well, thank, thanks for coming. I'm excited to be here. When we put together the, the program of folks that we wanted to come and sit in conversation in the community, you were one of the first people who came to mind because we're in your community. You, you, you grew up here. I, I want you to start by, by just some reflections on where, what part of this neighborhood you grew up in? What was it like growing up for you? Because I want to start with Will Conroy, the, the young man. So go back to your early self. So I moved up to Seattle from Portland, Oregon when I was seven years old. And uh, I started and I, we moved up here and we moved into the emergency housing on Yesler. And so I went to Bailey Gazzard uh, from, from second through fifth. And then I went to Washington Middle School. And then we moved out of the emergency housing and my mom was able to magically uh, afford a, to rent a house over here. We were able to have a house and I lived there for 10 years. Mm -hmm. So all through high school. So this neighborhood, I remember walking. I literally, when I, the nostalgia I get, I remember us not having a car. So I remember us walking from Beacon Hill down here to Safeway, get groceries and roll the basket all the way up to the house. So this area I'm very, very familiar with. And uh, it's actually awesome to see uh, how they're trying to put spaces like this in the neighborhood and uh, uh, spent a lot of time at Van Nassau Community Center and, uh, and uh, Wing Luke and in there, this, uh, what is this right here behind uh, Safeway? Uh, I can't remember, but it, uh, it's, uh, it's a basketball gym. It's right here behind the Safeway. Okay, ba basketball gym. It's a basketball okay. gym and it's okay. kind of like an after school program for, okay. for kids as well. So. Spent a lot of time there. You remember? You and your gospel mission. There you go. You, 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 you're speaking in case you can't see on camera. There's some Garfield people in the room. So Garfield, go ahead. And give us, go ahead, Garfield people. Give a snap. Um, but but before, we, before we go too far with that, there are also a couple of Franklin Quakers in the room also. So any, any love for Franklin people? Any love? <laughs> Earth Quakers. <laughs> but what I'm hearing as you describe your growing up, Will, Without a car, you're walking around the neighborhood as a kid. How, mm -hmm. old, how old were you? Who? Uh, yeah. Once we were able to understand eight, nine, ten, we were able to go out the house by ourselves. So walking, walking around, yeah. and on Saturdays, probably going out and just playing. For right? sure. And going, and going to the For store, sure. walking to the neighborhood. Public spaces, public parks, For sure. public gyms, and just making your way around. I mean, I remember doing your chores and trying mm -hmm. to, you know, scrounge up a dollar. Just to be able to walk down a Safeway, and I don't, I don't know if you guys are—I know you guys are kind of young, and some of the crowds in here—but you can get a 25 cent soda. Uh, the select sodas at Safeway with 25 cent, you just pop a quarter in, and we used to come down just to get those. We'd walk a mile just to get those. So, 
you, you make that allowance, that dollar allowance that went a long way at Safeway right here. Um, and, and you're using some language that, that young people may not know. You use the word chores. That's interesting. No, right, right. No, no. <laughs> As an eight, nine-year-old doing, doing chores, because I want to come back to, to the nature of, of childhood. Because this, here's this image of you at eight or nine or ten years old uh -huh. walking. When did you start to play sports? I've always played. Uh, when we first moved here, um, Central Area Youth Association was not too far from Bailey Gazard. So uh, I know you guys probably know what Rotary Boys and Girls Club is now. Back then, Central Area Youth Association was that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my mom was the cheerleading coach there. And so I played football and basketball for that organization for, for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so uh, probably from like eight until uh, high school started, I was in that Central Area Youth Association program, and uh, it was kind of family. Like It was like a way of uh, introducing us to the city and making it home for us. Mm -hmm. So the city was home for you, and you made your way around the city. Um, when did you know you were good at sports, and how did you know? Well, it's, it's funny because you always know, looking back at it now and as an adult, <laughs> you always know you're really good when the coach is making all type of accommodations to make sure you're at practice. And so when I couldn't make practice because we had no car, or I had no way, he would pick me up. And so that's how you know that you're really good because the coach is like, we can't go on without him on the floor or him on the field. And so uh, as it started to move on and on, I started to grow older and older. I start to realize how important, and my mom actually started to realize how important I was to the team. And so she would tell the coach, if you want him there, come pick him up. And so we kind of used that uh, as a way for me to get there. So that's when I started knowing I was uh, a little bit better than the other kids. You had coaches in your life. You had mentors in your life to help you get situated and make your way through school. Absolutely. And you knew you wanted to go to Garfield. Mm -hmm. And you guys were okay at Garfield, huh? Oh, yeah. We, we, there's a lot of talent there. And a lot of guys that I grew up playing with at the Central Area Youth Station, it was an easy transition because it's right down the street. And so... Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of talent, a lot of history mm -hmm. uh, of greatness, and so you want to go into that space uh, of, of greatness and, and try to uh, add on to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you didn't go far from, from Garfield when it came time to pick a college. I did not. So I want to I hear a little bit about um, how you knew you were going to be re recruited to play at the college level and what made you decide the University of Washington. Interesting enough, I, I, I was a big, um, obviously, I know my audience. There was a, a group of basketball players called the Fab Five at University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. And Jalen Rose wore number five, and I wore number five. I wore number five. I'm old now. And, um, and so I kind of fell in love with Michigan. And then Jason Kidd was at Cal, and he wore number five. Mm -hmm. And so the guys that wore number five that were really good, those were the schools that I liked. And as I got older and became a junior and senior, I started realizing uh, you actually have to leave home to go to those schools. And that's something that I didn't want to do. And so University of Washington offered me a scholarship uh, my senior, the junior summer going into my senior year and I turned it down because I wanted to, I wasn't ready to commit. And so they gave me an option. They were like, you got to take this scholarship now or we're going to give it to someone else. Who was the coach? Uh, Bob Bender. Thank you. And, and, I, and so I wasn't ready to do that. And so as the year, my senior year uh, came about, I had a couple offers from some East Coast schools, Xavier, uh, Pittsburgh, um, some schools, uh, some, some, some lower level schools. And I, we played, ironically enough, we played Franklin High School. I wouldn't smile. We beat them by 40. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so we played Franklin High School, and the UW coach was there. And I actually had a really good game. And uh, that night, he, the assistant coach, Byron Boudreaux, he texted me. He said, are you ready to stop playing around and be a Husky? And uh, I was like, no, nah, I do want to be a Husky. He was like, but here's the caveat. There's no scholarships left. And that kind of put us in a tough space because I, I, I come from, you know, humble backgrounds where, you know, we can't afford school, college like that. I did do really well on my SATs. I, I think I got a thousand on my SATs, which was 
well above board uh, at that time. You just needed an 850, I believe, or 820 or something like that, and I got 1,000. And so I knew academically I could get some help. Uh, but he said, don't worry about it. He was like, we'll figure out a way for this to happen for you. And so at that time, no one really wanted to stay home. Like all the good basketball players, if you go back and you look, Jason Terry's, he left and went to Arizona. Uh, Doug Christie, he left and went to Pepperdine. All the really good ones, uh, Brian Scalabrini left and went to USC. All the really good guys didn't want to be here. They just didn't. It wasn't a fun place to be. And so I've always been raised in my household to be a leader. And, uh, and leaders sometimes make decisions where they get people to follow them. And so even with my son now, I tell him he, 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 he looks at me, not to get off track, but he looks at me and he says, Dad, no one's wearing that. Like, no one wears that. And I tell them all the time, well, leaders decide what's cool. And so you decide what's the in crowd. So if you wear it well enough, someone's going to follow you. And so I was born and I was raised that way. And my mom is like super alpha and she's that way. And so I said, I'm staying home. And so uh, luckily enough, a kid, luckily and sadly enough, like one kid who, who had the scholarship, he didn't get his grade. So I was able to get his scholarship day one. Uh, and so, uh, but I was coming into a space where the, the point guard in front of me was just all league as a freshman. And so everyone told me that I was making a huge mistake in my basketball career to go there because they were saying that you'll <clears throat> never play. And the way I thought was he's got about two months before I'm taking that job. And uh, by the end of that year, I ended up being the starting point guard. I watched you uh, play. At the University of Washington, so. That's my story, how I got to the University of Washington. I'm extremely, extremely uh, blessed to say that I graduated from the University of Washington and, and growing up here, Ed, right here, mm -hmm. I thought the University of Washington was 50 miles away from my house. I never went down to campus. I thought it was so far from my house. I'd never been to Mont Lake. I never did any of that. And so when you start to realize really in proximity how close it is to everything, you're like, this school is really the city school. But, you know, if you guys are from this area, you, you never really travel down that far. And so... Because we're about 11 miles from campus, maybe 10 miles, but it and seems it's a, like... And it's, it's a straight like shot. It's a straight it's shot. It's a straight right? shot. <laughs> I mean, I mean yep. people wake up now these days and run 10 miles a day. But for, from the lens of a child that doesn't have much means and transportation, that could be a thousand miles, mm -hmm. miles away. Let, let me ask another question. I'm going somewhere with this. So, so when you learned to play, did you play some pickup ball? A lot of it. Okay. Outdoors? A lot of it. Hands got dirty? Play to 15 by, by ones or make it, take it? That, okay. that was the way. Okay. It, I knew no other way. Uh, okay. How about this? How about whoever had a neighborhood, whoever had a hoop in the neighborhood, we were using your hoop. And so we had a, I had a group of friends, and we would wake up, and we'd be out the house summertime, 9 a.m., 10 a.m. Whoever's hoop was available, we'd use it. And if we break, like, it was adjustable hoop, so we'd lower it to dunk. And then if we broke their hoop, we'd just move on to the next person's hoop. Mm -hmm. That's what we did. <laughs> and sometimes play with or without a net. Like, having a net was no, a, net, was, net didn't yeah, matter. Net didn't yeah, matter at okay. all. Okay. So, so all of that, um, that's a sense of how you, how you came up. Um, all of that's changed now, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. and, and, and all of the parts of just walking around the neighborhood for kids at age 9 or 10, around the very same neighborhood, mm -hmm. um, going to the store with a, with a little bit of change, um, trusting the neighborhood, going to public spaces. Mm -hmm. um, are they growing up the same way you grew up? Absolutely not. Okay. And it's, it's, it's a good thing and it's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the good thing is you always want your child to have better than you, mm -hmm. right? You always want your child to have better than you. The bad thing is your child, your children, are not facing the same adversities of life that, that made you who you are. And so that's the tug of war with raising children today is, you know, my daughter's in the back seat saying she wants mod pizza in Starbucks. And I'm like... She's mod, in the back seat. <laughs> mod pizza and Starbucks, and we were like, it was a great weekend if we were able to get McDonald's. Great weekend if we were able to get the dollar menu at Wendy's. And she's saying mod pizza and Starbucks, and my son's 
AAU program is cost darn near a thousand dollars to just be on the, in the program, and that covers the travel, and you got to do all that. So the times are way different. And and like I said, I mean, my son's uh, and daughter's uh, elementary. My son's in middle school now. Well, my my daughter's elementary is probably from my house uh, to Safeway is about how far in proximity the school is to my house. And my wife will not let my kids walk from there right. to here by themselves. Mm -hmm. Not ever. Right. She will drive or walk them every time. Mm -hmm. And so that piece of it I don't like. Like, I don't like. I think it gives you a level of responsibility to hold your little sister's hand, learn how to cross the street, learn how to fend for your little sister, learn how to fend for yourself. And, I, and, I, and that part is nasty to me, and I, I dislike it. But also, we live in a climate where... Um, um, chaos is, is uh, gratified. So obviously we live in a, in a climate where you, you can look at uh, social media and, and most of it that gets most of the likes is chaos. And so people do a lot of things um, because cameras are rolling. And so... So I want to ask you about, about Will, not just about Will, your son, but about the circumstances around him. Mm -hmm. So I'm older than you. When I, when I played, same thing. I would, I would walk around the community, learn how to play, got my hands dirty, played with those rubber balls, um, went to most of my games by, myself, and taught myself how to play. But it was high school ball was if you, if you wanted to try out for a team, you could and you could make your team if you were a decent athlete. Mm -hmm. My sense is that day of trying out for a team if you're in eighth or ninth grade, and if you haven't started, that those days may be over. And I ask this in part because when I looked up your son, mm -hmm. I just touched the social media, and images of him playing pop up. Um, he's got a following, and he's how old? Uh, he just turned 12. He's got, an, he's got a, a powerful social media presence. Uh -huh. How does that affect his childhood and his ability just to play? What does that mean for a, for a child? He's clearly talented, yeah. but what's going on around him is fundamentally different than what was going on around for you right. and, and for me. What does, that, what does that mean for his It's life? challenging. It, it is challenging because, uh, one, he's everywhere we travel, uh, the kids know him, and there's a target on his back. Everyone wants to play against him. And he, my son, he, I, I don't let him have social media right now. And so a lot of stuff that's posted or said about him, he doesn't see it. And so he doesn't understand. He just wants to be 12 years old. He just wants to be, he wants to hang out with the regular kids. And, and, and he doesn't understand why guys are going extra hard versus him. Now, as he's starting to get older, he's starting to hear why now. And, and so he's starting to walk around with a little more confidence. But when he was 9, 10, 11, he had videos that went viral with millions, millions, millions of impressions. And so that part of it is, is very challenging. Um, and to answer your first question, it was like, yeah, in high school now, there's no making a team randomly anymore. These coaches know who these kids are before they even step on campus, before they even get to high school. They already know the team they're picking. And so it's very hard for an a average, uh, or I won't even say average, a, a guy who's just been in a park or the community center for the last seven years but just hiding his game and just waiting to get to high school and play. Those days are done. Coaches know exactly who they want on their team. Um. Talk a little bit about what the college experience was like for, for you. Um, you stayed all four years all at, four. at Washington, by, by choice. Mm -hmm. Did you know you were going to stay all four years? Mm -hmm. uh, well, well, I mean, I, I, I figured I would finish for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you ever think about transferring? Never. Why Never. not? Why not? Um, as I'm a firm believer in uh, finish what you start. Mm -hmm. And so it didn't matter to me who we recruited. I always felt like they had to beat me out. And I've always felt like, uh, I've always felt like that. I've always felt like I could beat someone out, or no one would beat me out. And uh, that's that's kind of been my mindset. And unfortunately, that's not really the mindset of kids these days. It, it, it sucks, but uh, that's always been who I've been. I mean, uh, I think it comes from, like I said, my mother being very strong, mm -hmm. and uh, coming from humble backgrounds where she had to fight a lot for to get everything that we've had. So I, I was able to see that. You were a popular player. Did you have money to live on? Did you, did you have travel money? Did you have money to play with when you were 
when you were a student, student athlete? So by the time I got to be a sophomore, freshman, sophomore, I, I pretty much uh, depended on those scholarship checks a lot. Okay. You know, that, and that Pell Grant was, was huge. It was just enough, just enough to get you, to get you by. Well, you, and also, you know, you would send a, you know, money home to the family, too. So, did so you were yeah. getting extra, you would send a little home. Yep, yep. And so. Yep. So that was back in 2000, 2005. Everything has changed. And, and, we're, and, and we're speaking here with Alexis Harris, who's our faculty athletic rep, and um, Regent, Regent, Regent Harris. And we have been witness to and, and helped structure a fundamentally different experience for student athletes, across the board for student athletes, but especially in revenue generating sports. And so I think about what it must be like to be a coach now where students can transfer when they want to transfer. Mm -hmm. And the second part, I want, I want you to give a little bit of a primer, just from a coach's perspective, what name, image, and likeness is and what it means for student athletes and what it means for coaches. So I was very on board with the name, image, and likeness. Uh, and here's why. I believe that at 18 years old, when, the, when, the, when you enter college, it's, and you're playing college basketball, it's, you're generating money for the university. And I believe that you should be compensated at somewhat besides just an education for that. Um, what's happening now and name, image, and likeness is, is that. Okay, so name, image, and likeness is you can make money for uh, how popular your name is. So uh, if you were able to play really well, someone may want to go into business using your likeness or your name. And so I, I'm, a, I'm a big component of that. I, I, I like that for our student athletes. But now, because it, it's so new and it hasn't been policed great, it's running wild, and so now you get a lot of um, student athletes who are looking for name, image, and likeness money rather than a, a great playing situation, and so that's what's changing the sport. But I don't fault them, Doc. I don't, because some people, this will be the peak of their playing career, yeah. right? And so if this is the peak of your playing career, you would want to make the most of that financially, and so I understand that piece of it. But also, for, for people who can play further on, don't take something now when it can be much greater later when you're just looking for a check now. And so it's a, it's a, it's a very, very, very slippery slope. We got here in part because during the time when you played and before your era, there were student athletes, men and women, who played for, for veritably nothing. They played mm -hmm. for their scholarships, but had no money to, to have their parents come to see games. I, I played for four years. My mother actually never came to a game, couldn't afford to come, come to a game. We played out of state, right? So those kinds of things were at play. So now this has changed things. How have those things changed it from the coaching perspective? So we see how right this is mm -hmm. in some respects, perhaps the potential to go too far. What's it like from the standpoint of coaches to have athletes have the ability, and your players have the ability, to go any given year to leave, mm -hmm. and to also make money, perhaps even more money than you, as a coach? Yeah, yeah. It's it, well, making more money than me as a coach is tough, obviously, but uh, as a coach, looking at it, it sucks, right? Because you 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 want to have you want to build a culture as a coach. Like in anything in business, let's say we're all business owners, you want to build a culture in your business. And so to have a culture you need to retain, you need to have uh, camaraderie, and you can't have camaraderie and, and culture if it's constantly changing. And so that piece of it is very tough. But also, if you look at it, if, I was a, if, I'm, if I'm just being a dad, and I'm looking at it as a fan of the game, then I'm saying, well, Coaches can go take other jobs right away, and they can coach right away. So there's two ways to look at it, and, I'm, and, and like I said, it's, it's a very great area, um, but I do think there needs to be um, some parameters laid in, 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 a, in a space where uh, it's not just chaotic, and right now I think it's chaotic. Can you coach players for one year at a time or two years at a time? Talk about how difficult it is when players leave and how you can get them to stay 
leadership and character mattered to you and a commitment to staying because of your, your sense of pride. Mm -hmm. Is that still present in college athletics? I don't mean just the University of Washington, but college, college athletics in general. I think it's, it's becoming more and more less relevant. Mm -hmm. And so what can change that? I think, uh, and I use this word a lot, uh, you have to coach with love. Mm -hmm. And I believe love will trump everything. And so sometimes when you love something so much, you don't care what the outsiders are saying about it. You're like, no, I'm here. This is, I'm good here. And if it's, if it's no love, then they'll be easily poached by whoever's in their ear. And they'll, they'll listen to a million different people uh, because there's no loyalty to anything. But if you, like, man, I love coach or I love the University of Washington, I love the gym, I love the fans, I'm not going nowhere, then you'll stay. It's almost as if I'm hearing you that there's a thin line between Will Conroy, the father, and Will Conroy, the, the coach. Mm -hmm. Do you coach your players almost like you father your, your son? Your 100%. Daughter? Yeah. 100%. And I feel that's very important. And I can tell you this, Doc, I've lost some kids uh, to the transfer portal who broke my heart because I put so much into the kids. Um, but obviously, they have to go into a situation where they feel they can be most successful. And uh, it will be like, you know, your, your, your son coming in and saying, well, my son coming in and say, Dad, I know you're coaching at the University of Washington right now, but I want to go to another school. I'd be heartbroken. You know, I'd be heartbroken. But it's the reality. Um, so all you can do is kind of, you know, I've always worn my emotions on my sleeve. I've never, never been a guy that, that uh, – try not to show my emotions with, with someone. And if I like you, uh, pretty much I'm going to pour into you like you know, you're one of mine. Mm -hmm. so. You've been known as a, a leader on the court. And people still to this day, when they talk about Will, Will Conroy, it's, it's leadership and, and discipline. Um, the part that not that many people know, because you keep this part of you quiet, um, you do a lot of work in this community aside from basketball. Talk about some of the ways that you give back to the community. And so b before you answer that, you left for a while and you went on a pro circuit. You, mm -hmm. played, you played professionally, you traveled some, you traveled um, around, the, around the nation mm -hmm. um, and some internationally. You went away for a while. Talk about going away for a while and what brought you back. And then I want you to talk about the, the service that you do in the community. Well, I went away, finan I went away financially. Um, I've always been goal driven. So my goal in life was to play in the NBA. And there was nothing in the world that was going to stop me from doing that. And so I was able to uh, get a couple of coffee in the NBA a few times. And uh, I got offered a big deal overseas. And I actually called my college coach, Coach Romar, and I told him, and I said, look, man, you know who I am. I've I played in the NBA now. But I think I can be, I, I think I can be better, a better player in the NBA. I just need to stick around. And he says, well, Will, why well, don't you go put some money in your pocket and come back and do it? And so I did that. But I, I never really enjoyed my, my overseas experiences because my brain was always in the NBA. And so uh, I liked it, but I didn't love it. I loved the idea of fighting to play in the NBA because that's what I wrote on my wall when I was 13 years old, is that's what I'm gonna do. And so I never really sold out to being over there, and so I never really enjoyed it. And so uh, the second part of your question. Uh, what brought you back to the very community that you, that you grew up in after your ventures around the, around the world? And I, I never really left, so every summer I would come back and I would put open gyms together right here at Rainier Vista Boys and Girls Club. And so in the morning, I would uh, work out all the NBA players that from the community. I would I would grab them, and I and I and I send out in a group, this group message, and I said hit Brandon Roy and Nate Robinson and Jamal Crawford and Isaiah Thomas, and all the other guys that you guys can think that made pro around here, and I put a group text and I say we're playing tomorrow at 10 a.m., and then the gym would be packed, and you know we would shut it off at about 15, 20 people, and it would be a because it was the summer programs in the community center, so all the kids would be around 
the glass walls watching all the NBA players play, which was awesome. Now, I want to pa pause there a second, because you yeah. just said that so quickly, which is interesting about what you just said. Yeah. You named a whole bunch of names of people that if people don't follow, these, are, these were young men who grew up in this community. They went to Rainier Beach. They went to Garfield. O'Day. They went to Gar Garfield. They Garfield. They grew up. They played. Maybe had some, some time in the NBA, mm -hmm. some more time than, than others. Mm -hmm. And they came back to the very community, and you're texting them, because they've come back home again. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So we were... Our basketball community is very tight-knit. Mm -hmm. And for us, a big thing for us, uh, the group of guys that I'm really close with, we call ourselves the home team. Mm -hmm. And, and, and our, our biggest objective was to pour back into our youth. And, right, and, we, and we use a, a terminology a lot. We say, send the elevator back down. Mm -hmm. And we say, don't just get up there on the top floor and just you're up there by yourself. Send the elevator back down to bring somebody else up with you. And so that was big for us. And so we would do a lot of stuff that we would do would be right here in the community. We wouldn't want to do it out far. We would want to do it where kids could touch us. And so when I would have those open gyms, it was good for the kids in the community to be able to, uh, like these glass windows is just like this. They just sit outside and watch us play. And then afterwards, these guys go out and take pictures with the kids and, and become one with the kids. And that was huge. And then after that, at 12, I would have a high school group come in and just work those guys out and try to teach those guys the habits of being uh, college and pros. And so that kind of led me into my coaching uh, because I, I started finding a solace in that rather than playing overseas. So I started finding more love in helping kids and pros rather than playing the game. And so um, to answer the second part of your question, I, I would do backpack giveaways every single year or turkey drives or coat drives or book drives or uh, we would do, I would partner with World Vision and we would do uh, toy drives for Christmas and, and just try to um, provide haircuts and backpacks and books and, and the main objective of it was to make sure that our kids in our community had the same uh, starting point, uh, so to speak, as a kid who was going to Bellevue High School. And, right, and so that was very important for us because me being one of these kids uh, who didn't know who, how I was getting my hair cut the first day of school, didn't know what I was wearing the first day of school, or didn't know how I was getting to school, we wanted to take that off of parents' plate and at least be able to provide that for the first quarter of school. You're describing all of these young men, and I suspect the young women as well, Absolutely. in the community that come back to the community, give back to the community, and are driven by a certain ethic. But the image we have and the narrative we have of, of star athletes is that they go away and get, get wealthy and, and, never, and never come back. Mm -hmm. But you're describing something fundamentally different. What is it about you, um, the young men and women in, the, in this community? What is it that, that Well, we love home. All of that? We loved home. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people earlier, like I said, they, they were so, like, they wanted to get out of Seattle. I don't know whether it was the rain or, or what, but we love being here. And so I've played in a lot of cities. I've been in a lot of countries. To me, Seattle was the best place in the world. And I would want to live here more than I would want to live anywhere. Now, I may want to visit somewhere when it starts to be really rainy here, but I want to live here. And so it was very important to us to come back to the place that we love, to give back to the kids and to the community that we, that we love. In a couple of minutes, I'm going to turn to questions from, um, from, from the audience, because I know folks want to have a conversation with you, Will. Um, so what are your hopes for, for young men and women in this community who aspire to do the kind of thing that, that you did? That the, the culture, the terms have changed a lot. It's a lot harder to get to where, mm -hmm. you, where you got to. Um, when you talk to young, young people, the, the five-year-old, the eight-year-old, the 10-year-old Will Conroy's, what lessons do you teach them? What lessons do you want them to most have? More than anything, uh, I, I think life is a feeling process. And so I want to make the kids feel something when I meet them, right? And so I can say whatever I want to say, but they need to watch me walk it and more than I say it. And so when I when I when I'm going to my son's AAU games, okay, so I'm a loud dad over there, but I cheer for all the kids. 
I'm not just cheering for my kid. I'll cheer for the kids on the other team. And so as I'm saying to my son, play defense, play defense, and the kid scores on my son, I'll tell the kid that scored, man, that was a great move. And so that's walking it to me. Or after the game, going up and speaking to a team that just lost to our team and going to help their coach in their huddle and say, man, you did a really good job. You guys are right there. And I think to me, that's walking it. And so when I walk off, I know the coach can say, hey, that's the associate head coach at the University of Washington. He said, you guys did really well. And so now those 12 players feel better about themselves. Right? And so the same thing with my daughter, as I'm watching her try to figure out what avenue, which is gymnastics and track right now, it's the same thing. So I, I kind of know the platform that I have and I know the importance of when I was 10 and 11 and, and someone who I probably looked up to, if he would have said these things to me, could have pushed me a little bit harder than I was going. On, on a couple of occasions you've mentioned, you and I talked about your current coach, mm -hmm. Mike Hopkins. But you've made reference to Lorenzo Romar, who was your coach years ago, maybe as much as many as 20 years ago. And you stay in touch with him, and you talked to him recently. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, your players that have left and, and, and 20 years from now may reach back to you, what do you want them to say about you? Do you want them to be in touch with you? Yeah. I'm assuming I know the answer to that. Yeah. Do you want them to be in touch with you? And coach loved me. He loved me. Mm -hmm. When they're grown men, do you want he, them to say Coach loved me. Yeah. And so I watch Coach. Uh, I watch coach with his kids and his family, and I want to be like, like when, I, when kids walk out of here, I want them to, you don't have to say it to me, but I want to give them things where they walk out of here, like I want to be with my family, like how coach is with his family. And so that, that kind of stuff right there is the things that, that be on my mind uh, when I bring my family around or when I walk in with my kids and I'm holding their hands. And when at 21 and 19 and 20, when I used to look at Coach Romar, I used to be like, man, that's a man of principle, character. And, and, and some of the things that he taught me that back then, I may have thought was corny, uh, but as I got older and I started maturing and I started to understand, like, these are life lessons. And these, this stuff right here can take you far, far in life, like, you know, being 15 minutes early to something rather than just showing up a minute uh, looking folks in the eye when you speak, being presentable, um, just all these life lessons that he, that he taught me that at the time I kind of fought him for, I fought with him over him for the first two years and then I finally like give, gave in and was like, man, I understand what you're trying to do for me. And, and it was great. Now I'm liking this because you are sounding a little old school oh, and we, yeah. we were talking about so that the, even the symbolism of a jersey tucked oh, in. Oh yeah. Right? Oh, you, yeah. You, want your, you want your players to have to be tucked in when they go onto the court. Do, do they look at you and go, that's kind of old school? Is they, that do. they do. But they you do. Stand, but you stand by your principles. Then. Because there's a level of discipline that it requires. And, and there's a saying is the more disciplined you are, the more free you are. And like, and, and I never, it never made sense to me, but there's a lot of freedom within discipline. So if you, if your discipline is every single morning, you're going to get up, you're going, uh, you're going to make your bed, you're going to put your shoes up, your room's going to be clean every single morning before you leave out, right? That's your discipline. Now think of all the freedom that you have within that. Okay. So my room is clean now. What else? I can do a million things in my room now because my room is clean. And so kids don't ever look at things like that. And sometimes it takes you a while to understand it, but there's a lot of freedom within discipline. And I think like keeping a jersey tucked in, it's part of a discipline that I think it's a small one, but it's one that, you know, kids need to have. But the small things matter. I want to turn to questions. If you have a question, Sally, has, you have a mic? I'm really intrigued. You were talking a bit ago about uh, name, image, and likeness pressures, the portal, what it means to coach in that environment. I'm curious, so we, we talked about what is the future of the student-athlete. How does the student part of the student-athlete work in this new realm of being able to go to another school, being able to uh, market yourself and be able to be compensated for the role that you're playing in the, in the, success, the financial success of a program? What does the student part look like now? The student part is very challenging, and we actually have one of our academic specialists here uh, sitting right here, Jason, he deals with a lot of our players, he, and he's phenomenal. Um, that part of it is very challenging because um, 
it's almost like they can, the, the kids now can threaten you with the fact of leaving and transferring. And so how much discipline can you treat them with if they're always like, all right, if you do that, I'm leaving. All right, I'm leaving. And so it, it kind of puts you in a very tough space. And then they also have seven or eight different people in their ear, which is like AU coaches, trainers, like, you know, if you went there, they'd give you this. Or if you went there, and so you're fighting against that also. And so you have so many different elements that you're fighting on a day-to-day -day basis. Every day I look at my phone, I'm worried that one of the guys are getting ready to leave or uh, coach, when can I get a name, image, and likeness deal? And, or I'm getting a text from Jason and saying, hey, this guy was late to or this guy missed this. And so I'm like, okay, how do we want to handle that while treading softly until that portal date closes? So it's a very, very tentative space that we're in right now. Well, I want to ask you, related to this, um, this, this culture of winning, especially in college athletics now because multimedia now and everybody's paying attention, there's, there's a different kind of pressure on, on student athletes now and pressure on coaches to, mm -hmm. to win. Mm -hmm. um, are there some things that you won't do as a coach in order to win? Are there players that you won't take a risk on? Mm -hmm. Are there some lines that you'll draw? Are there some, some players that you'll give up on? Where are the lines that you draw? And, and what decisions do you make in that regard? There's definitely lines that you draw. You, 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 there's character. It has to align with, with who you are and what you believe in as a coach. And it uh, has to align with your team. Uh, obviously, um, the, the, uh, the mental side of it does, it, does it align? But also, uh, it's challenging for me, just, I'm just how I am. I think I, I, think I have the ability, which is, which is a, I have to get better at this. I think I can save everyone, right? And everyone can't be saved. And you, and you think that, okay, this guy didn't do well there, but I know with, with me, he'd be better. In some, in, in some scenarios, yes, but you know, I was told red flags never turn green, right? And so I've never believed in that because I think with the right person, it can always be help. But uh, that's just something I have to get better at. But that's one of uh, a small area that I, that I have to grow in. So you're willing to let some players go, even if they're exceptionally talented, but they don't align with your values? You have to. Mm -hmm. and it, it, even it, if that means it might lose you some games? You have to. I mean, you know, I'll give you a story and in, in, in goes back to Coach Romer, okay? So some of you guys will laugh at this, some of you guys won't. Uh, so we were, we're getting ready to play in an NCAA tournament, first tournament that we've made. This is my junior year. And so we're on the road, we're playing in Ohio, but we traveled two days before the game. And so the, the band got to go and the cheerleaders got to go. And so we're all in the same hotel. And so the band throws a party uh, two floors above my room. And so it's two now, and listen to me, it's two days before the game. And so curfew was at 11 or 12, so I can't remember. And uh, so, me and my, so me and my teammate, I won't use it, I won't say his name, because he's not here to defend himself. So we, we go up to the party. And I was like, okay, this is cool, you know, all right, really not my speed. And so I go back down to the room. And so now it's getting close to being close to curfew. And so my teammate comes in and he's like, yo, I think that I can get such, such, and such cheerleader to come to our room. And I say, okay, not bad. And so they come down. So I call another one of my teammates and I say, hey, there's going to be like a small little party in my room with a couple of the cheerleaders, so come down. And so he comes in, and this within five minutes of them being in the room, and I hear boom, 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 boom on the door. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's a coach's knock. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, man, go get the door. I'm like, I'm asleep. And so... The girls are like hiding all over the place, like under the bed, like they're hiding, right? Everyone's fully dressed, no, nothing, no, nothing like that. And so one of the assistant coaches come in and he says, you guys have to be kidding me. We're getting ready to play in an NCAA tournament game and this is where you guys' mind is at? And so at the point, I'm a junior, I'm the captain of the team 
And so he's, he tells the girls, get out of here right now. And so the teammate that I called, who was one of the stars on the team, he hides in the drapes of the curtain. And so you, and so you can't see him at all. And so the girls run out, and me and my teammates get scolded by the assistant coach. And so like 20 minutes go by, he leaves, we're in there, my other teammate runs to his room. So we're in there like, how do you think Coach Romar's gonna handle this tomorrow? I was like, we're like, how, how do you guys think, we're talking to each other all night, how do you think Coach Romar's gonna handle this tomorrow? He was like, man, he ain't gonna trip, man, we didn't even do nothing, we didn't, we didn't do nothing. So we wake up, breakfast is at nine. We go down, and Coach Romar, you, you, you have a good relationship with Coach Romar. You can call him, he, he validate word for word what I'm saying. And uh, we get to breakfast, and he says, he, he comes, and he's a guy we hated to disappoint. And so he walks straight to us, and like, you can, he was like, it was like Bigfoot coming to the table. Boom, boom, boom. That's how I remember it. And he's like, you two. I cannot believe what you did last night. You guys, I don't even know what I'm going to do. I, and he's like yelling. And like there's a, the other team, the other two NCAA teams are like at breakfast too. But he's like scolding us, right? And he didn't, he, Coach Rohr never used foul language ever. Um, and he's like just getting into us. And he's like, we're going to meet and I'm going to say what I'm going to do with you guys. So we go back up to the room, and I'm like, okay, he's a, he was a little more mad than I thought he would be. And I said, hey, man, here's the deal. You just need to tell him that you brought the girls. And I had nothing to do with it. I was in the room chilling. And he was like, mm, okay, I'm going to tell him that. And so he met with Coach first. And so he comes back to the room, and I say, what happened? What did he say? He said, he's not, he not going to play us in the first half. He's not going to play me in the first half tomorrow. I said, did you tell him that I had nothing to do with it? He said, yeah, I told him, but he want to talk to you now. And so I get to his room, and he says, did he tell you that uh, what I'm, what I'm going to do to him? And I said, yeah. Did he tell you that I had nothing to do with it? And he said, yeah, he tried to tell me that. But here's what I'm going to tell you. You're the captain of the team. You should have told him that wasn't a good idea. So with that, you're going to get the same discipline that he has. And I say, coach, we're playing in a NCAA tournament game tomorrow. And he says, the program is more important stakes, right? than you two guys playing. And so we lost that game 100 to 102, okay? And we got in the game, we got in the game with, I wanna say with like five minutes to go in the first half, we were down like 16 when we checked in the game. And so, if you think about that, the, the, the change that would have happened if two starters are starting, we would have played in the next round. That team that beat us ended up going to the Sweet 16 that year. And so I, I, at that point, I didn't understand why he did that. But as I got older, I understood. And I talked to him about, I talked to him about this several times. And he told me, he was like, Will, it was about making you guys grow up. And so if I turn a, uh, a cheek to that, you'll think you can get away with that kind of stuff. But here's the power of that story. Um, 20 years later, you're telling that, oh, that yeah. story. You're oh, not yeah. talking about a win or loss. You're talking about that story and what that lesson taught to you. And I bet you have a coach's knock now. When, you, you when I knock on the door, probably hears a coach's knock. When I knock on the door, they know it's me. They know it's you. And I, and I, I raise my hand to do room checks. I want to do room checks. <laughs> so that's, that's my responsibility on the road. I, I see, I see heads yeah. nodding. Are there other questions? Uh, see, there's a question. So I want to bring it back to uh, the community standpoint that you were talking about. You talked about the days of like, you know, the kid who, you know, is playing in the backyard all summer long, trying to get ready for high school or whatever. How does that uh, plan field, how do you even that plan field out? Is it just over with? Or is there a, a sense of like, even the plan field out with those young people who don't have the same opportunities of growing up in an AAU program or having the money to travel and do all those things? How do you 
how do you even that out in a community like this? That's a good question. Let's that's see that, if we can repeat the question, Will, for the that's a folks great, that, That's a yeah. great question. So what I hear you saying is, how does that kid who doesn't have the same resources get an opportunity to give himself that platform in high school to be seen and evaluated the same way this kid who's coming in with a little bit of uh, clout or a little bit of hoopla? How does he get seen the same way? That's what you're asking. That's a very good question in this, in, in this day and age. Besides growing seven inches, uh, and, and, and last summer was 5'9", and this summer he's 6'6", six, six, I, I don't know. I don't know because the game is, the game is such in a, in a space now where you have to kind of already beat somebody, right? And I think that here's what I will say. I will say all the great AAU programs, um, sometimes development is more important than your son or daughter playing on the great programs. Sometimes they should play in, in maybe not as good program to develop more and be more of the catalyst rather than being on the, the team that gets the most attention. And even with my son, who gets a lot of attention, I still, I still fight that line too right now today. And he's one of the better players on the team, but sometimes I'm like, maybe we need to take a, a, take a step back because we're not developing things that I want you to develop. And so uh, I would use that to kids who, like I would say, join the local Van As uh, Van Asel, uh teams. Join the local uh, Rainer Vista teams. It doesn't always have to be the Rotaries. It doesn't have to always be the Friends of Hoops. It doesn't always have to be the, the teams that are traveling the most. But if there's a coach that is going to pour into a program and spend his time and develop, do that. That's what I would say. Other questions? Good answer. Resources matter in this. And it's not just basketball also, because you, you mentioned AAU sports which means teams are getting on select teams and they're traveling and maybe for basketball, as many as, they're playing 80 games. Mm -hmm. How many games does your son play during the course of a year? I think last year we played 88. 88 games. From, from, and, he's, uh, and he's how old? From, I wanna say from January until August, 88. 88 games. 12. Okay. I played, 11 at that time. I played 15, but that was before the turn of the century. Um, <laughs> you're supposed to laugh, I'm not that old. Mm -hmm. um, but, but that means cost associated, and that's true for volleyball, that's true for soccer, that's true for now most sports. So if you don't have the resources to take that trajectory, and part of that question is, can you close that gap? Which is almost a, excuse the term, Alexis, it's almost a sociological question also. Can you close that gap if you don't have the wealth? Because there are a lot of kids with talent who can kick a soccer ball, but if you don't get on a select team, and you don't get to play those 88 games by the time you get to high school, you don't have a chance unless something really unbelievable happens, like you, you grow to be seven. Well, Dr. Taylor, you can, let's take sports out of it. That's private school, public school. Right, All right. right. Yeah. yeah. So who's yeah. getting the best resources, private or public? So you can look, it, it, it goes, it's not just in sports. And so that's where places like this can help with that gap. That's true, and yet public schools had always been the, the great neutralizer. I'm an educator and, I, and, I, and I'm an advocate for, for choice, um, for parents being able to choose what's right for their kids, mm -hmm. let, me put it, let me put it that way. Um, and I'm also a believer in public spaces where kids can play and just get, get better. But, but does that have the same kind of, because you described growing up by going out and just playing and becoming good enough and having people carry you along. Mm -hmm. Are we done with those days though? And is, the, and is that fair or does it even matter at this point? I think it, it's, I don't even think it matters anymore. And, and part, of the, part of the reason is a lot of parents, and this is very sad to say, a lot of parents put a lot of pressure on kids to be, um, develop faster than they probably are developing. Like you see parents and their audiences and crowds, and even you watch it on social media, there's parents that are just crazy. It's like, like, let it build. 
let it gradually come. And so everyone's into instant, 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 and there's no process anymore. Mm -hmm. The process is lost. So this, kind, this is the kind of thing that goes viral, Will, and I, and I, I want to know if it happens in our community because you're at, at a lot of games now. When I was at games, sometimes I was surprised and appalled by the things I saw from, from our folks, from, from folks in my community. Um, the way that we talk, the way we engage, the way that we've overinvested. Um, can you influence in that in some way as a, as a parent and as a coach? You've got a reputation in this community. Do you ever intervene in the stands at kids' games? Do I do. Do you intervene with other parents? I do. Mm -hmm. I do all the time. I do all the time. I, I, uh, and I, I, I'll go up to a dad or I'll go up to a mother all the time and I'll say, man, your kid did really well because I can see them steaming. I can see uh, uh, your, your, the development is coming. And just to take a little bit of edge off. And look, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I don't get frustrated sometimes with, with, with my own, with things that I think that we work on and, and, and he doesn't do on the floor. I get frustrated too. And I think that's the, the beauty of having a balance in your home with my wife. She's like, okay, well, ride home with mommy today. Let daddy cool off. You know, and that's okay. You know, and sometimes my son's like, no, I want to talk. I want to, I want to talk about it with dad. Sometimes I want to talk about it with mom, but, but you need that balance. And I talk about this with Dr. Harris all the time. And she's just like, just be mom, let mama bear be mama bear. And like, be the, uh, the, the landing spot for the kid. And so. Sally's coming to the microphone. Do we have maybe one final question? Alexis, do you have? We'll take well, two final questions, but we'll, we'll be succinct in our answer. Um, you say you went to Garfield, even though you lived down here. I don't know, maybe that's like something people back in the day did, where everyone down here went to school in Garfield, even though it's like so far away. But that's besides the point. That was just like I had to say. Um, but I know like a lot of kids from Seattle, they go to UW for basketball and all that. So unbiased opinion, you have to be unbiased. But out of all the schools down south here, you know, which one is like looking like the best players are coming up. Would you say Red Beach, Garfield? You know, unbiased. That's it. Those two schools. You know, this is going to be recorded too. Yeah, so yeah. Be, <laughs> this is going to be recorded. I think that Rainer. I think that Mike Bathia has done an unbelievable job at Rainer Beach over the last 40 years. I think that's the toughest job in our city. I really do. Uh, I think that all the walks of life that comes in and out of his gym, and and the things that surround his gym uh, is very trying. And I think that he's the right guy for the job. And I think that uh, he's done a phenomenal job. I think just with how our community is changing and uh, more, more families are starting to move further south, I think that you can find a lot of good programs out south. Federal Way is very good. Auburn High School won the state championship the year before last. Uh, and so you're starting to see, even Tacoma, uh, uh, Wilson High School won this year, or Curtis High School won this year, and so you're starting to see more and more talent out further south. And so, yeah, it's starting to, it's starting to become all over the city, not just in, at Garfield, even though Garfield did win the state championship this year. Dr. Harris, you get the last question. Yeah, I'll try and be really brief. Um, as a sociologist in the room, I, I think Will was right, pushing back and, and sort of um, saying that contemporary sports with AAU and the costs, right, is a microcosm of education in general. And we do have inequality gaps between our educational systems in public here in Seattle and, and nationally. So, and so, so kind of bringing it home to the UW as a public institution and you seeing other institutions, you interact with other universities. Mm -hmm. What would you say is the added bonus of going, of being at a public university, and what does UW specifically offer to our students in that would from the Seattle area? What does UW bring educationally, academically, uh, in terms of athletics that other universities don't bring? I think just, you know, on a on a very simple platform, I would say. Uh, a UW degree is very, very big in the state of Washington. And so most of the people that own everything here uh, are UW graduates. And so you're walking in the door with that piece of paper, you're going to at least get an interview. And so if this is where you would like to live, uh, that's important. And I say that to a lot of the guys that I recruit here, 
and I say, if you come down to the University of Washington and you do well and you don't burn bridges, you should be able to have a good job for the rest of your life around here. And so I use that all the time. Um, you know, I can't really speak a lot on other universities. I know, obviously, I had a guy who I, I, I ended up getting from Stanford and a very, very smart kid. And, you know, obviously, his, his degree holds a lot of weight. Um, and so, obviously, there's a lot of places. I mean, besides, you know, I won't, I won't talk bad about Washington State and Oregon in here. That's just me being personal and my Husky pride showing up. But there's a lot of great institutions. But obviously, I love that one down the street more than I love any of them. And will I be left with an image as we close of a young Will Conroy, age 8, 9, 10, walking through a community um, with a little change in his pocket, um, buying some groceries, with, with hands that are dirty because you've, you've played with the ball out, outside and beckon friends to play along with you so that you get better, so that you come to a place like the University of Washington and have your life changed. Go out into the world and experience and see the world only to come back and give out backpacks to kids so that someday there'll be a kid with a little backpack that will follow your path because you've stayed close that you've touched them and they'll become a Husky and change their lives and they'll send the escalator back down again and again and again. And I can tell you this, Dr. Taylor, I think about that a whole lot. When I make my drive from Auburn to the University of Washington and no matter how stressed out I think I am, I always remember how blessed that I am to be able to say that I was, you know, one of maybe 20 kids and probably one of one to be able to do everything that I've done on the same street, right? So everything that I've done and completed in my life, uh, I was able to travel 10 to 12 minutes up and down this street and do that. And so very blessed you've and very left, honored. You've never left home. Uh, Thank you, Will, for being a part of this. I'm, uh, yeah, but you've got a couple of sports fans, so it's not, it's not too unusual that we ended up with your name on a list like, yeah, Will Conroy, we'd like to talk with him. Let's have Will. <laughs> um, and it's fantastic that we were able to have you here tonight. Thank you so much. Last round of applause, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.